As part of our work at the Cornell Institute for Women in Science, we became interested in the topic of sex bias and hiring, and particularly whether sex bias was responsible for part of the underrepresentation of women in math intensive fields of academic science. So, this interest led us to plan and execute a national study. Numerous blue ribbon panels, national commissions have concluded that there are a shortage of women in these math intensive fields because of both explicit and implicit biases in the hiring process. One would have thought there would be really solid experimental and actuarial evidence of such sex bias in hiring and we were really quite shocked in pouring through this literature and it, it took us many months to digest it all how little evidence there was and in fact there was no experimental evidence there were experiments, many of them, showing that there were sex biases in hiring, but not of professors, not of tenure-track professors. Why study this question? Well, it's a really, really important question because if sex bias in hiring is limiting women's participation in math-based fields of academic science, then we're hobbled right from the starting gate. And many of the programs that are in place need to really focus squarely on just this issue. If, on the other hand, sex bias in hiring is a thing of the past, if the society has moved forward and if all the educational programs have worked, then clearly the resources that are being deployed need to be deployed elsewhere to fix the problems that are really limiting women's academic careers today. One thing that I think uh, really surprised us when we started this project was, as I said, there was very little, almost no experimental evidence but there actually was a lot of actuarial evidence that went opposite to the bias claim. By that I mean there were a lot of very large-scale studies that looked at who got hired. And these studies, again going back to the mid-1980s, showed that over and over again women were hired at a higher rate than their fraction of the applicant pool. So women were less likely to apply for jobs in math intensive areas, but if they did apply, they were more likely to be interviewed and more likely to be hired. So that being the case, uh, we wondered, well, how can people be making this claim of sexism if women were actually more likely to be hired all the way back to the mid-1980s? And some people have you know, retorted to this by saying, well, they're more likely to have been hired because they were stronger candidates. That is to say, fewer women applied for the jobs, but of those who did apply, they were stronger. They had, they had sort of survived this winnowing process in graduate school, and only the, the really strongest survived the pipeline and applied for a job. That's why we did the experiment, because in an experiment, you can control for quality. So we were able to make the man and the woman identical in terms of scholarly quality. They were both described as 9.5s on a 10-point scale, which is really exceptionally strong. And we could equate that across all the various conditions. And our conclusion was that the actuarial data uh, was very consistent with the experimental data. In both, there was this strong female preference. Our experimental design involved five national experiments. Each one had strengths, and each one, of course, had weaknesses. What we did was to make sure that the different experiments were compensatory, and that they each answered questions that the other ones couldn't. Our national series of five experiments involved presenting a slate of three shortlisted candidates on paper to 873 faculty who evaluated each slate of candidates and selected their preferred candidate for the job. The job was an assistant professorship on the tenure track. And these three people included, uh, most importantly, a male and a female candidate that were otherwise identical in terms of their scholarly accomplishments. But this was disguised because uh, they were described in certain personality terms differently in a way that was totally balanced. So if we described, for example, the female candidate as an analytic powerhouse for some faculty for, uh, and the male was described as 
uh, you know, creative genius, for example. For other faculty, they were reversed. So the male would be described as an analytic powerhouse and the female as a creative genius. But this was done largely to disguise what our true hypothesis was. We didn't want faculty to say, oh, I know what they're, they're about. They're trying to see if we prefer the woman or the man uh, because they're otherwise identical, whereas disguising them with these different personality attributes, people thought that's what we were really interested in. Would you prefer to have in your department an analytic powerhouse or a creative genius? So you, you had typically faculty saying, uh, we think the female is, is the one we would hire in our department. And this was true uh, for male faculty as well as female faculty. It was true in all four of the fields that we examined. We, we had faculty from economics, engineering, biology, and psychology. And we chose those four fields because two of them are mathematically intensive, economics and engineering. Women are very underrepresented in those fields, whereas in the other two fields, psychology and biology, women are really quite well represented. So again, we found this really very pronounced female preference, about two to one. And there were a couple exceptions to this. One exception were male economists. Uh, despite female economists being just like the male and female psychologists, biologists, and engineers, male economists had no preference. Statistically speaking, uh, they were gender neutral. So the male and female candidate were preferred by them equally often. One potential criticism of some of the components of our study is that people may respond in a socially desirable way. They may choose a woman if they're given a slate of candidates that includes one woman because they feel a need to respond in the way that they're expected to, but that potentially when they vote in a real departmental situation, they might not vote for the woman. To evaluate this issue, we sent some of the people in our study just one candidate to evaluate, obviously either a man or a woman, and these candidates were all identically qualified with the same credentials. And what we found was when looking at one candidate, people still evaluated the woman much more positively, wanted to hire much, her much more often than the male candidate. She was seen with identical credentials as being more hireable than the male candidate. And we interpreted this as, as meaning that values of diversity had become internalized. They weren't simply triggered by comparisons of women with men, but they were internalized to the point at which an equivalently competent woman was seen as more desirable. What was interesting was that when the data started to come in, we started to see a very, very pronounced female advantage. It turned out to be over a two-to-one advantage. And what this meant to us was that the ideals of diversity, which are promulgated and taught at modern American universities, and which, of course, have been the topic of so much training and so much attention over the past 40 years, have largely become internalized at this point in time in the population of faculty. One of the implications of our findings is that various interventions that colleges and universities have implemented in the last two decades appear to have been very successful. So for example, gender sensitivity training for faculty that are on selection committees or search committees appears to have worked because people seem to have internalized the value of diversity. They really seem to want more women on the faculty, and this is just as true of male faculty in our study as female faculty, and again, across all fields except male economists, which, again, didn't have a, a gender preference. So these kind of interventions seem to have worked, and so I think now it's time to think about other interventions that may more effectively address women's underrepresentation since our data and the actuarial data indicate their underrepresentation has nothing to do with sexist hiring practices. One question we're asked is how do we reconcile our findings with the experimental findings on sex bias? And the answer is easy. First off, our experiment is the only one that looked at the hiring of tenure track professors by actual tenure track professors today. The most recent study that looked at tenure track hiring by professors was done 16 years ago and it was only done in the field of psychology, which is already a largely female field. Our study is the only one that looked at math intensive fields that are predominantly male and the only one that used as subjects actual professors, 873 of them.
We've looked in the past at the role of childbearing and child rearing in women's decisions to pursue academic careers. And we found, of course, as everyone would imagine, that the amount of energy women put into having and rearing children is an extraordinary amount of energy. And essentially, the modern university puts women on a 10-year timetable that creates a need for women to make their greatest intellectual accomplishment contemporaneously with their greatest physical and emotional accomplishment, which means they're having a baby, they're nurturing a child, they're preparing a 10-year dossier. And it's hard for women to do this and to want to do this all in that same 8 to 10-year window of time in their 30s. So... Much of the women's underrepresentation that we see may not be due necessarily to bias so much as limitations of the reproductive clock and women's limitations having to do with child rearing. Perhaps some of the programs that we have now could be redesigned to better accommodate the needs of women who are trying to juggle parenthood and career. We're often asked, what can be done? What can we do to bring more women into math-based fields of academic science? And our earlier research speaks to this issue. One of the things we found was that it's extremely important to keep girls interested in math and on the math BC track if they have any academic aspirations. The other thing is to think about women mentors and women teachers who can shepherd the process of bringing girls and young women into math-based fields of science. Research has shown that mentorship and, and direction from women is very important to the development of girls and their preferences for careers down the line. The major lesson of our research is that women who have an interest in becoming professors in math-based fields of academic science should apply. They should apply now because their chances of being hired are far greater than their male colleagues. Mm -hmm.